I'll have most of them. And if you have some, bring it in, but I'll have most of them. I've got pretty much all of them for those that can't afford anything. Don't worry about it. We'll cover it. But but if you if you're ever gonna do any electrical work, you need to start thinking about getting some of them started soon. And I will tell you, doing electrical work is a whole lot easier than changing hot oil filters. Nothing wrong with changing hot oil filters for a living, but I'd rather do electrical work. It's a lot more mentally stimulating. No hot oil. Hot, no hot oil running down your armpit. Right. <laughs> seems like uh, for the people who understand it, there's much fewer of them Jesus who are understanding the electrical part of it than, than the rest of them. That's, that you're going to be more able to write your ticket if you understand more demand. Oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, actually 6337 is even better. It just flows out a little bit better. And we're going to use, for soldering, we're going to use rosin core. Um, one of the biggest problems you guys have, soldering is not, it's, it's an art form. You've got to practice it. That's why this lab is designed around doing as much soldering as it possibly can. You've sort of got to get used to getting the soldering tip hot get a little ball of solder on it, because the solder tip itself won't conduct heat well. But if you get a little ball of melted solder on there, and then touch it to what you want to solder, it'll transfer the heat very, very quickly. Things will get heated up. It's like a one, two, three, feed a little solder in, and you're done. And it makes a nice concave or yeah, concave joint. So it takes a little bit of time for things to melt. You want it at the lowest possible temperature to, to where it'll still flow out well and won't produce a cold solder joint. Okay, The cold solder joint is a joint that the su surrounding materials don't get hot enough, so the solder flows, but it's so cold that it sucks the heat right out of the solder so quickly that the solder shrinks and fractures as it's hardening. So it gets little micro fractures. Again, it'll work until a little bit of heat and vibration then it'll start intermittently causing the problem. We often will see two different kinds of flux, acid or rosin. Do not use acid. I don't know. In fact, it's not even good for copper pipes. Um, you want to use rosin core solder. Um, what the rosin does, or flux in general does, is it cleans the surface. It protects um, the heating process and the soldering process, as you feed the solder in, it wets out over the molten solder and the surrounding metals and creates an oxygen there, prevents oxygen from being there during the soldering process. It also acts as a wetting agent. So uh, you know how, like if you use a wax, an anti-wetting agent, uh, it's hydrophobic, water will beat up on it. But if you get just a little bit of oil on the paint, Water will flow out into it because that's the, the oil acts as a wetting agent. Well, the same thing is true with flux. It acts as a wetting agent for the molten solder. So if the solder is starting to beat up, it's probably because you don't have either the metals are contaminated or you don't have enough flux. Well, we make good electrician's flux solder. It's very fine. It's like it's it looks very much like thin safety wire. But if it bends really stiff, it is thin safety wire. Don't use it. You're not going to get it to melt. And I see you guys like to take and put a little piece of safety wire in your neighbor's, your buddy's little solder box, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a mean thing to do. <laughs> Don't do that. That's something Mr. R.C. would do. I know. Nah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So the other thing you guys don't do a very good job of is keep the tip clean. Now, what gets the tip dirty? Leaving it on. Extra solder. Yeah. Leaving it on, leaving it hot. Okay, they will oxide, oxide, uh, start to corrode and oxidize. Uh, I have some stuff for cleaning them. I mean, you can start out with with it really cold and some Brillo and clean all the crud off, as well as carbonized uh, flux. Etc. Clean them all up, 
So then we'll start to warm them up and we try to retend them, uh, get them to where they, they work a little bit better. Uh, the better soldering stations, like I like the Weller one I've got, um, they operate with a stable enough temperature that the tip actually will last a long time. But I rarely do I leave it on. I just don't do it. What I do is I set myself up with four or five components in place, okay, all nicely in place, or locked in or taped down or whatever. Get you know several things in place. Turn the thing on, heat it up, solder, 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 solder. Do a bunch of soldering, occasionally cleaning the tip. We clean the tip in a wet sponge. Standard organic sponge that's wet works really well. It rubs the stuff off. They also have these little cup holders that you can put some Brillo in there. There's also, you can put Brillo and must in, in, in an emulsion of hardened rosin. Uh, so I've got a couple of things for trying to retend and cleaning tips as our tips get uh, problematic. So the first thing you're going to do once you get things good and hot on the tip is apply a little solder to the tip. Get it clean, a little solder to the tip because if it doesn't have it, what you're going to end up with is a round surface trying to touch a round surface. The contact area there is going to be minuscule. But if you have a little dollop of solder, a little dollop of solder on there, small amount, it doesn't need to be much. And of course, it can be problematic because if you're moving uphill, the little dollop tries to run to the bottom. So you kind of go over to the top and work your way. But, but that does a whole lot to help conduct the heat out into your components. The other thing that's problematic is you've got to heat both parts. Theoretically, you're soldering two things together. So if I've got a lug that comes down and a board that's like this with a hole in it, right? And then I've got a trace that comes around like this, okay, and the bottom of the hole's right there. And that lug goes through, comes out the bottom. I've got to get my tip in there. I've got to heat the wire up, but I've also got to touch the, the trace a little bit. So if I get a little dollop of solder in there, get it in there, heat, feed a little in, and it'll fill that in real nicely. Okay? But if I'm just holding the wire, just touching the wire, the wire will get hot, but this won't. And then what you end up with is, on your board and your wire coming through, you end up with a very nice solder that's beaded up like this, but isn't really soldered to the board at all. No. Okay. Now what's sitting in here is a nice clean layer of flux coating everything because you didn't get this hot enough. Yeah, that's the flux is not conductive either. No, no, it's not. Uh, same thing, multi-strand wire, we use it extensively, but it takes a little bit of extra heat to get the flow to go in, and then as it starts to flow in, they start heating some, you know, the wires next to them, the next to them, and really thick stuff, I'll solder from one side, they quickly go over to the other side, and then back and keep working it from both sides until I really get a lot of heat into there. So again, enough heat to get the job done, but not so much heat. Now this is problematic if I've got a component like this and a lead that comes down like this into a board and I'm soldering that and all that heat's going up in the component and frying it. Okay. Those of you that later on are going to be doing the magneto timer kit, note there is a programmable uh, integrated chip that goes in there. Those should not be soldered. Also in the bag will be a little socket. The little chip will fit right into the holes that the socket fits into and solder in nicely. You may or may not damage it. So far we've been lucky. It seems like about every semester somebody doesn't pay attention, doesn't read the directions. Okay, there's a little socket that goes in. You solder all the little leads, all 16 leads. Then the very last thing we'll do is take the chip and pop it down into the socket. That keeps the chip from being damaged. Uh -huh. 
And as well, if the chip does someday fail, you could pop it right up with a new one. Okay, so a lot of stuff can be destroyed by the soldering process. Um, so a good joint should look like um, and I'll draw it through a circuit board, but it doesn't really matter. Um, a good joint, the lead should come down like this. You can project out just a little bit. Okay, the solder should flow out real nicely like this on both sides. Now, some circuit boards, and I think that's going to be true of your soldering kits, the trace doesn't come through to both sides. It's just on one side. If that's the case, then it, the solder is only going to be on one side. Okay, the copper trace isn't on both sides. Bad solder joints end up looking, you know, like this, uh, you know, not contacted underneath. Uh, the other side, there isn't enough, and you can see daylight through there, on and on and on. There's all kinds of different potential uh, problems for bad solder. The upper one, you have to solder from both sides or just one side? If you do it well, if it's a double trace side, which better quality circuit boards are, if you do it right and you get the heat right, it'll flow in. This will be a little bit less, but it'll flow in nicely. Okay. okay. Now I got a whole bunch of, of, of circuit boards, just test circuit boards and a big box full of radial resistors. So you get plenty of opportunity to practice soldering. Do you heat from the bottom one? On this one, you can heat from either side. And in fact, if I soldered it from here, and I didn't get very good flow there, I might come back and hold the soldering gun here for just a little bit and try and draw some of the solder down. Okay. You can do that. It's better to come back and do it again, let things cool down, and then come back and hit it again, than rather to keep there and doing. Now, it should also end up looking fairly shiny and polished. If it starts getting gray and funky looking, it's because you've been at it too long, you burn all the rosin off, and now the solder is being subjected to oxygen. Okay. Okay. So at that point, you need to get a solder sucker, pull all the solder out, pull everything out, clean it all back up, and start over. Um, it's also important to note that in all uh, uh, inline joints, I'll talk about those, in all cases, brazing, which solder is a form of brazing, Brazing is not structural. So if the component is kind of heavy, you know, it's a big heavy relay or something like that, you need to glue it down, screw it down, some other way attach it. So that as the radio bounces around or whatever it is, um, the component doesn't rattle itself loose because the solder will not hold it in place. Pretty common to see things like a large capacitor or a battery or big relay, it's pretty common to see them either screwed in place or a big dollop of hot glue or epoxy or something else. Um, so yeah, no acid core, bad. Um, if you're using what's called rosin core, where there's the, the solder is actually hollow in the very middle, a little bitty solder and it's hollow in the middle with just enough rosin. Uh, I find if I've got, I've got a little bottle of liquid rosin. If I'm doing big fat battery wires, I always put a little rosin on because that helps draw the heat in. You, you've got to do so much heating to get them to go. Uh, it ends up making a much better joint. But for most general, you know, 16 gauge, 18, 24 gauge wiring, as well as electronic components, uh, the, the rosin that's in the core is enough. Uh, so again, rosin does help when you've got large, that's what I said, larger wires. Um, the other thing you can do is sometimes if the wire needs to go into a hole that's, you know, reasonable size relative to the wire. If it's a really tight wire, tight hole, don't do this. Okay, so for example, like the little tight hole that we do in the coaxial connector, that little pin, don't do this. Okay, leave the wire the way it is, get it very tight and get it in there, then solder it. But for regular type connectors uh, or, or type solder joints, it's not uncommon to most, or aircraft wire is always pre tin It's copper wire, but you should pull the stuff and look silver. That means each strand is tin. Add a little solder to that and pre-solder it. Just a very 
light solder. You don't want a heavy blob there. Then put it in, crimp, and a little bit more solder, and you're done. Now, note that um, we'll say, well, many, many times we'll say that um, crimp-type crimp connectors are solderless connectors. And they were designed to be solderless. And the FAA says they're solderless. And go forth and be solderless. Uh, I've found in many, many, many occasions a little dab, if it's an environmental connector, meaning it's out in the salt and the rain and etc., throwing a little dab of solder on the, on the crimped end does a good job of sealing it. So if I've got my connector, uh, you know, my connector is like this, the barrel is here. And sort of comes around and the, the ring is there, that kind of thing. I stuff my wire into there, I crimp. Putting a little dab of solder into here to seal it uh, isn't a bad thing. You're not trying to send any solder up into here. Okay, all you're trying to do is seal that and it'll wick back into there. Uh, the two connectors that we're gonna do in our in our uh, P lead project, one is insulated, the other is not insulated. I'm going to have you seal both ends uh, just for practice soldering, okay? But for the most part, crimp connectors, we don't necessarily need to seal them like that. They're meant to be solderless. What I can say is I've been installing a lot of wires over the years, and those that are in the environment, uh, by doing that, they shouldn't tend to last a long, long time. Um, I, you know, I... Sky's the limit. There's so many different types of connectors out there. Um, I can begin to describe. So, ring and spade are pretty common. We don't really use anything but ring. The horseshoe things, and eh, throw them in the trash. Okay, in aviation, ring connectors. I there are some applications where we're seeing spade connectors being used. I do not like spade connectors. What does the spade connector look like? One end is a spade, the other end goes over it like this. Oh. Okay. They either don't have positive retention, or they do have a positive retention clip that will not unclip, and you rip the wire out. Okay. Sad. Not a fan of spade connector. The ring is kind of what you want. So, Crimping, proper crimpers, installed in the crimper correctly. Don't put it in backwards. And then crush. Crush the right amount. Okay, if you don't do enough, it'll be a weak joint and it will electrically corrode and fail. Too much and you'll actually cut the wire. You can actually have cut the good. I've gotten like Gorilla on it and cut the connector right now. So yeah, I've kind of talked about some of this. So this sort of shows um, what the bifold pipe looks like if it's crimping well. Um, we've sort of talked about this. The aviation type, oftentimes you can tell. The, the, the really cheapo Craig and Auto Parts one, they have this sort of opaque, funky looking insulator. The aviation ones look that are good quality. The nylon insulator is a little translucent. You can see through it a little bit, okay? And they almost always have the inner barrel and then an outer metal thin sleeve, and then the insulation is, is a, a nylon. Uh, like I said, it's a little translucent. Do not use the automotive type in an airplane or your oven, which I had one guy do once. Ended up blowing the door off the oven. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was a little story. Okay. And they've got color coding. Uh, really fine, fine gauge. You're rarely going to use a connector like this. You're probably going to use a multi pin connector, D sub, D sub, or something like that. You will not use this type of a terminal. Down in around 18 to 22 gauge, yeah, it's fairly common to use red and then blue. You're not going to see, again, on the other end, yellow being used too much. At that point, you're going to either use a special connector or a soldered lug as you start getting in. You start getting down into 10 and 8 gauge. You're talking about the main lead for the alternator. Okay. Pretty, pretty heavy duty wire. Mm -hmm. 
in which case having the insulate the conductor the, the shell of the crimp area insulated with a piece of yellow plastic and I'm gonna have a boot over the whole thing right okay I'm gonna do it right okay so for the p-lead we're gonna start out with you're gonna get six inches of shielded wire that means there's an inner wire with insulation then a wrap of shield and then outer insulation all stuffed inside here now what we're going to do is we're going to peel some of the outer insulation off take some of that outer braiding and very gently set it off to the side and then we're going to take and add a second lead to that a second piece of wire solder it all together and then heat shrink that all together so that I have the main center conductor and a separate little pigtail that I can attach to ground. Okay, the very thin you'll see the very thin wire that is the braiding for the outer shield. It's not strong enough to be really connected to uh, a terminal. Okay, so this shows it all stripped off in one piece. Yeah, it's not going to work. Okay, by the way, you might go just a little bit longer here. I, these are rough approximations. So an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter, something like that. I would suggest you strip off little bits at a time. Okay. And if you use the kind of grab and tear, you might cause a problem. Okay. So it may well be you kind of score and cut, pull some off, score and cut, pull some off. Uh, so this shows it being done in steps. Okay. Um, okay, so I already talked about that. Now, there's a couple ways of doing this. What I need to do is get the inner conductor out of here. I can either very gently and carefully use like a dental pick or something to unbraid the wires and get them all off to one side. Or in this case, what I did is I pushed down, created a little bit of a pucker, and opened up a hole and started pulling the wire out. Now note, I've already got just a little bit of plane, and I've already broken a couple of these wires. Okay, these are really delicate wires. And those 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 silver wires are it's, it's they're shielding. It's they're shielding. tin. They're shielding, but they are tin copper. Tin copper, and they need to go back into the the connection. Well, you'll see. So note how. I now pulled them all off to the side and gently wrapped them up so they're a little bit stronger. But I still have a couple of little broken strands. So I'm going to be as careful with that as I possibly can. Um, what I would do is wait on this end. I would get all this part done. Um, to make this work, you're going to want at least an inch from here to here. So you're actually probably going to want to strip a little bit more. This is going to be just a hair short. It'll work. You might want to strip just a little bit more. Okay, in this particular case, I'm showing stripping looks like uh, 3 16 there. That's about right for the crimp that you're going to put there. So then we're going to take a second pigtail. And this is our pigtail that we're going to connect to that ground shielding. Okay. So and again, it looks like I stripped it a little bit more than a quarter of an inch. Something like that's pretty good. Okay, this is where you guys kind of get messed up. I'm going to take my ground shielding that was going this way, and I'm going to gently lay it back this way, put these two wires together, and then wrap the two together. So now my ground shielding has done a U-turn, and this wire has just kind of angled up just a little bit. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to solder this, snip it off, and then lay this down up against there. And then when I do some heat shrinks, it's going to be nice and tight. And now I'm relying on a nice strong wire to ground this rather than this really flimsy, not nearly strong enough wire. Okay. Any shielded wire, this is the proper way to terminate them. Um, and you'll see if you buy, you know, pre-made wire and harness from Garmin, etc. Even all of the shielded audio wires, they'll do something along these lines. They'll pull the shielding out and create a separate shielding lead coming off and not rely on the shielding wiring itself. 
Okay, there you can see I got a fairly lean solder in there. Okay, that's all soldered. In fact, the solder ran up into here just a little bit. Uh, I've been very careful to not break this. Also note, just for giggles, I pretend this. I don't recommend that because it, it may not fit in the connector. Um, but you're welcome to try it. There's a better shot of it. You see how that's a nice lean solder joint? Everything's covered, but I don't have, you know, big globules sticking out. Or I've suddenly added two pounds of solder to the airplane. Okay. Now, this doesn't need to be that strong. I can cut it off right about here, something like that, because the strength is going to be the heat shrink wrapped around all of this. Okay. I just need enough to make a decent electrical connection. So there, I've snipped it off. Set some heat shrink over it, okay? And in this case, we're going to double insulate it. So there I am shrinking it. So this is one layer of heat shrink. See how that clamped it down pretty good? And that's become a whole lot more secure. Then when I take a second layer, and note that the second layer is a little bit longer. So I create a little bit of a strain release there. Now the second layer goes a little bit beyond and a little bit beyond here. So I've got a nice clean strain relief there. And I've got the two leads. See how this kind of got short though? So if I've only got a half an inch there, it's not going to be enough to work with. You're going to want to have at least two, three, five eighths, and three quarters of an inch sticking out there. All right. So then we're going to um, note this is a cheap automotive type connector. It's very opaque and looks like PVC. And, it's funky and not so good. <clears throat> we're going to put this on and crimp it, and we're going to put this on and crimp it. Only we're going to also have to put some heat shrink on this. So you're going to have to get some heat shrink on here, get it all the way back here as far out of the way as possible, put this on, crimp it, keep this cool while you do a little bit of solder there so that the heat shrink doesn't shrink back here. Then once it's cool, bring the heat shrink back out and heat shrink it over this. Um, also note that I'm going to give you, this guy's a smaller ring stud than this one. When we're done, you're going to have some plates to attach it to, and you've got to find the correct washers and lock washers and nuts and hardware for installing it out of 4313. <clears throat> uh, note, again, cheap crimp. This isn't brazed at all, but at least I do have it in the crimping device correct. Okay. So when this thing comes up underneath, it'll stab up. If I had that in backwards, that thing coming up underneath would just split these apart and it, would, it wouldn't work at all. It would be a horrible thing. Okay, so now it's getting kind of crush. Okay, so see how that went up in there and stabbed it real nicely? Um, Same thing, put the crimp in there. Uh, and, and then, see how I did a very nice, just a little bit of sealant on the end here. Okay, now I don't know if I got heat shrink on here or not. I could have screwed up. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I got heat shrink. You see it right there? That ends up looking really nice. It does a fairly good job of sealing it. And it helps create a strain relief right there. Okay. These guys, the insulation really doesn't do a very good as a strain relief. They do suggest that you crimp here and then come back out and crimp here. I find that doesn't work very well. I actually prefer non-insulated and then use heat shrink. Um, I think that does a better job. Okay. So, and this is the little fake magneto you've got to figure out. All right. Uh, yeah, that is attached. Then what's going to happen is you're going to have a prop strike. You're going to come up to me and I'm going to take my propeller and cut it. My side cover propeller and cut it. Uh, then you're going to have to repair it. So now we've got the prop strike through here. Again, you're going to strip three quarters to maybe five sixteenths back. Now they're nice and stripped and a little bit of portions. Now the problem is when we bring this together, the inner conductor, we're going to bring it together and solder it. That means the outer conductor is going to be a little bit short. 
So we might want to lob off about a quarter inch of the inner conductor on each side so that there's a little bit better overlap. Okay. So it's a little hard to see, but see how I made those kind of long? Uh, see right in there it says cut off just a little bit of, of the inner core lead so that you have better overlap. So now it's a little hard to see, but I snipped some of that off. This, what I did here, is I just did this with the wire ends. Now that's kind of funky and makes a little bit of a glop of, of, of a ball. You can also take the wires and do this and mash them down a little bit. But either way, when you solder either one of those, you're going to want to come back with a file and clean up all the little sharp uh, stalactites sticking out of there. Okay, so you see how that's all rough and sticking out? There, I've gone back and polished it up a little bit with the ripper file, cleaned it up some. Also note that I wasted a couple pieces of uh, heat shrink to hold the braid back out of, out of the way and protect it from getting damaged. Uh, polishing that with the ripper file, does that make any difference to the connection or is that just cosmetic? You just, what you're trying to do is eliminate any stalactites that are going to poke up through the, the piece of heat shrink that I'm going to cover this with. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're going to cover this with heat shrink. So there we go, a little bit of heat shrink and play. Shrink it down. Note that I actually have two layers, so I want you guys to do two layers. That means you have to get the heat shrink over your braid material. Okay, and then in this case, all I did is connected the two shields together and soldered them a little bit, and then you can cover that with heat shrink if you want. The alternate method, and then that's, yeah, that's what I did there. In the alternate method, what I did instead, pulled everything back. So note that I'm going to snip some off, then strip back to there. And then see how I sort of brought them together like this? Now when I solder that, I actually don't have to do too much to smooth it out. Uh, I could smooth it out a little. So. I soldered it, added a little bit more solder, and smoothed it out. That made a much smoother connection, right? Not nearly as bulbous. Uh, a layer of uh, heat shrink. Then I just took one layer of the wrap shielding, put over it, then the other shield over that, and I didn't bother soldering. Just as long as they're overlapped, there's not a lot of current running through the shield in this case. Uh, this, now, this is not a coaxial wire. This is only shield. So then the other one gets flipped over. And note, I already had some lead. I had some of the strands breaking here. Okay, cover it with heat shrink, mash it all down. Everybody's happy. Okay, you cannot do this with the coaxial cable. Shielded, yes. Coaxial, no. Coaxial, you have to cut the end off, put a standard appropriate terminal for it, and then put an inline connector for it so that it maintains the dielectric relationship between the center conductor and the outer conductor. Both the outer shielding is a conductor and the inner inner line is a conductor and an antenna wire or central wire. Okay, But shielded wiring, the purpose of this wire here is because I'm going to connect it to the primary lead or the primary coil of the magneto, which is going to be whapping at anywhere from 190 volts to minus 190 volts AC. And I'm going to run it up to my ignition switch, and it's not going to be connected to anything unless I want to turn the engine on. So big wire with all that voltage in it, that's an antenna. It's going to make all kinds of noise. So I wrap it with an outer shield that I didn't connect the ground so that all of that RF being produced in the inner wire just gets induced into the outer shield and sent to ground. doesn't do anything. Okay. Question. I'm pretty sure this PowerPoint is online. I also gave you guys a handout at the beginning of the semester that looks something like this. It's also online in the faculty page. 